Okay, so spooky bits and intro to quantum computing. How many here have had, I guess I should say, I myself, to start out with, I, I am actually an amateur at this, right? I'm a lay person. Not so, a. yeah, <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm not a professional quantum scientist. But, um, but and so there, it's possible that I've got some things wrong here, right? Um, this is what I know as best as possible, and I want us to have a conversation about, about it. Um, and afterwards, I'm also, I don't have the slide in here, but I'm also gonna present links to all the different places that I've gotten information from. Um, and that includes, I mean, there, I'm taking a course right now on quantum mechanics in Stanford. There's really, we're living in an information age that's amazing. We can actually find all sorts of information. Um, one thing I am concerned about is, um, is the question and answers, right? We're, there are going to be questions, I fully expect that. Um, I want, during the presentation, I want to make sure that I answer any questions that, that where you're confused about what I've said or didn't really understand about where we're going. But any questions that are raised by the, I guess you'd say any philosophical questions or any questions that make you, that you want to struggle with or fight against some of the, the premises, let's actually save those to the end, right? Because you probably should have some philosophical questions and concerns about what you're going to learn about here uh, when we talk about quantum mechanics. Um, and if you do have those questions and you do have those concerns, you're actually in good company. This is one of the pioneers of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr. Here's what he had to say about it. He said, if quantum mechanics hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood yet, understood it yet. This is Max Planck, another pioneer in quantum mechanics. He says, science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature. And that is because in the last analysis, we ourselves are a part of the mystery that we are trying to solve. That seems pretty fatalistic for a scientist to say that science can't solve this. That's pretty bizarre. And you're going to understand why, hopefully, if, if I've done my job right. This guy, Albert Einstein, you guys know. Um, this is a little esoteric in what he's talking about here, but I am going to talk about these things. It'll be a little more clear. But he used the term spooky action at a distance. It was uh, derisively when he was referring to a specific effect of quantum mechanics. He was trying to show that quantum mechanics wasn't complete. Turns out, on this particular point, he was wrong. And there have been experiments that prove that. And he also said this many times, as he points out here, as I've said so many times, God does not play dice with the world or dice with the universe. Um, which led Niels Bohr, the other pioneer, they had a little rivalry when it came to this. Niels Bohr would always respond with, stop telling God what to do. Niels Bohr is Danish. That's good to know. Niels Bohr is Danish. That's important. Uh, Richard Feynman, um, he was also a really bright, uh, brilliant scientist. He said something similar to what uh, Niels Bohr said. He said, I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Hopefully, I'll be able to get to the point to where what you don't understand is what you're supposed to not understand, right? That's, that's my goal here. <laughs> and this is uh, the guy I'm taking, a uh, professor at Stanford, that I'm taking a class right now online from, uh, from Stanford online. Uh, on quantum mechanics, he says, a good mental fight with quantum mechanic propositions is probably psychologically necessary if you are ever to get on top of the subject. So you're going to have to fight with some of the propositions that we make here in quantum mechanics, and that's perfectly normal, that's perfectly fine, but uh, we'll, we'll get through that, and then we'll just be confused about what we're supposed to be confused about. <laughs> There's pl many places to start when you talk about quantum. There's uh, about what, what it answers in the world, um, I chose to start with this question right here. What is light? That's one of the fundamental things that uh, led to, to us discovering um, uh, quantum mechanics. Another is, um, is about the nature of the atom. I think this is, this is actually a more compelling story for me. So I'm going to start and go through this. Um, for many years, at first, people didn't know what light was. We knew that sound was a wave because it had wave-like properties. When you um, if we open the door out there, you will hear the sounds outside from the speakers bounce in here into this room and spread out across the room, right? Sorry about that. And um, so that, that is, that is a, a spreading wave-like pattern that we recognize. Um, but there was also questions as to whether or not it was um, a particle. Is it wave or particle? And uh, that was the fundamental question that, that we wanted to ask uh, early, early on. Is light wave or is it a particle? 
This is Christian Hirgens. He might also be Danish. I don't know with a name like that. But uh, around 1700, he posited that light was a wave. And he said it has very similar properties. Again, if you turn a light on in a room and you have a door in, in, a, in a wall, you can see that light flood into, into the room that you're in. It actually does light up things in sort of that wave-like in nature. So he actually came up with some equations and said, no, light is, is definitely a wave. But he had a, an opposition in uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac Newton came, came up with a pre-atomic theory of, of, of particles that he called corpuscles. And he said, no, light is particle. And just because of who he was, he pretty much won the day, right? Because he's Sir Isaac Newton, right? If Isaac Newton tells you something about the nature of the world, you probably listen, right? And so for 100 years, people just assumed light was particle because Newton said it was. And there were some experiments that showed it. But um, light was particle, and Christian Huygens was his, his nemesis there. But then after about 100 years, this guy, Thomas Young, he came forward and said, you know, I think light is a wave, or at least if it is a wave, because it has wave-like properties, then we could probably do an experiment to show that. And what he reasoned is, if you could actually get, and you can't see behind this guy's head, but, uh, because he's not invisible, but um, there's a green ball over there as well. And he's making two different wave sources, okay? And if you'll notice, when he does those two different wave sources, Christian Harrigan says, if you could do that with light, if you can create two different light, I'm, I'm sorry, Thomas Young said that if you could actually make two different light sources, then there will be places where those waves, the peak of one and the trough of the other, will cancel each other out. And that will create a smooth position. Maybe we can see that in light as well. And if you notice here, these lines right here, those right there, that's where the peak in one wave and the trough in the other are canceling each other out and it's making a smooth, smooth place. And so Thomas Young created this chart. And he said, if we had a light source at A and B, they would actually interfere with each other if there were waves. They would interfere with each other. And then we should see a shine, a pattern on the back wall. And that pattern should show stripes in places where, where the particle or the, uh, the wave, light wave, actually hit the wall, then it would actually show light. And then in between, it would show dark, just like you would see if the, it's what they call the interference pattern. And so then he went and built a box. You know, this was, uh, uh, what, 1800s. He built a box. And in the box, he had a light source coming in one side. He had double slit, and that's the name of the very famous experiment this is, called the double slit experiment. He put a wall in the middle of the box, created two slits in the wall in order to create two light sources, and then saw what, it, what pattern it produced on the back of the wall. And that pattern was the interference pattern. So indeed, he proved beyond shadow of a doubt that light is a wave, all right? But then, 100 years later, this guy came along, Albert Einstein. He said, yeah, 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 light's a wave. We know light's a wave. But he, was, but he also said, light has particle nature. There are certain things that light does that seems like particle. And he wasn't the kind of guy to let current knowledge stop him from exploring something that maybe people said that wouldn't happen. He was the kind of guy that would actually create new knowledge or um, maybe expose the universe the way it really is. And in particular, this is called the photoelectric effect. He said that when you take a metal, and um, when you take a metal that has electrons in it, and you bombard that metal with a high frequency of light, it doesn't matter the intensity, but if you bombard it with a high frequency of light, electrons will get released, as if there is a quantity of energy in that high frequency, in that wavelength. It has nothing to do with the intensity. If you have a low frequency of light that you bombard the metal with, it will never release that electron. It looked like billiard balls, like there was some quantity of energy that was hitting the metal and releasing the, the electrons. And so he said, light is, is a particle, right? He actually came up with the term, or at least popularized the term photon. He said, light is a photon, a particle-like substance, right? That has a quantity of energy attached to specific wavelengths. And people said, but light's a wave. Thomas Young proved that. And he goes, yeah, I know. But you're saying it's a particle. He goes, yeah, that's right. 
right? And that's where the idea of wave particle duality came up. Einstein wasn't going to let one or the other be the winner. He said it has wave like properties in some cases and it has particle like properties in other cases. And that's what this image is supposed to be wave and particle. I expected an applause there, but I guess not. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so then the question was, if light is wave and particle, what does that mean? I mean, how, how, do, we, how do we deal with that? And one of the first implications was, or first thoughts was, well, we know that light is a particle because it has this, this quantity of energy attached to it. Maybe it's just riding a wave. Right? Maybe the light is riding a wave, and in this double slit experiment here, you can see that if the particles hit this wall right here, of course, they would just stop there. But if the particle, or photon, I should say, if the photon goes through these slits, then it would create an interference pattern on the other side. And so some scientists said, well, how about if we actually put a measuring device on the other side of that wall? And we identify which of those holes the particle goes through. Because we know it's a particle there, it's a photon there, and we know we're detecting photons on the end, but it's a wave too. As it travels through, when it goes through the slits, it's clearly a wave. So what is it? Right? It's got to go through one or the other. Maybe that'll give us some information. And so they put a measuring device on the other side of that wall to take a look. Oh, my eyes? Yeah. So they put a measuring device on the other side of that wall to look at it, and something strange happened. It stopped behaving like a wave. It started behaving like a particle, as if you were taking bullets and shooting them through each of these holes. It only created two blotch patterns on the other side of each of those slits. Right? I'm going to let that slink sink in a little bit. Because what that, this is one of the profound things in quantum mechanics. They looked at it in many different ways. And the way they describe it now, the language that is used is observing where the photon is changes the very nature of the photon. That's what Einstein had a problem with. Right? The uh, Schrodinger came up with a theory or an equation that could tell you where that particle might be, right, in this wave-like format. He came up with an equation to show you that it might show up here, it has a certain probability of showing up here, has a certain probability of showing up here, so forth and so on, right? That equation is actually very accurate in telling you what the probability is, but it's not deterministic. Einstein had a problem with that. He did not, he wanted things to be deterministic. He wanted the world to, to be like a, a, a billiard simulation where you could take one ball, hit another ball, and you can calculate what that does and where it goes. But in this case, as Einstein said, it looks like if this is accurate, at the very last moment when we observe the nature of light in our world, there's a dice roll to determine where exactly that's going to be. Right? Um, and uh, Heisenberg called this uh, the uncertainty principle. He, he actually called it his uncertainty principle. There's a whole history behind that as well, but it's actually fascinating. But I can't go over it now. So, remember we said that light was both wave and particle. And it's really important at this point to understand, and I won't go over some of the other experiments. Maybe I will at the end if we have questions about it. But it's important to note that the particle, the photon, is not riding a wave that literally it changes its nature. When it's traveling through space-time, it is a wave. It's not a photon at that point. And then when we observe it, whether we observe it by hitting the back wall or we observe it with a mechanism in between, it collapses, and this is the term, this is the most common interpretation of it, it collapses from a waveform, the waveform collapses into a particle, right? It's also important to note that the reason this is a big mystery all the equations that do this prediction to tell you where the waveform is, all those equations, actually, um, there's no way to collapse that waveform with math. It's a kludge. They go in there and say, well, it's a wave, and then something happens, and now it's a particle. And that something, when we say observation, sometimes they'll say measurement, they'll say observation. It's, we don't really know exactly what that is. There's been discussion that maybe it's consciousness, a conscious observer would cause that collapse. 
Others would say, well, no, computers can actually, or, or instruments can actually cause the collapse without us understanding or knowing it. But then there's another experiment that takes that away. And I won't go over that because it doesn't deal anything with quantum computing. At the end, we can probably go over that. It's really a bizarre experiment that shows um, that you can actually observe which slit it went through after it, it hits the wall. And that will still change the nature of that particle at that point where the wall was. It's the, they call it retrocausality. Don't know if that's exactly real, but that's, that's one of the interpretations. Another interpretation of this, rather than the waveform collapse, the other interpretation is, and you see, and you see, you see this a lot in um, science fiction, where um, they say that at all different points where that particle could be, a different universe is spun, spun off, an alternate reality that is consistent with all the laws of physics that we understand in that one reality, and there's another you out there that, f that went down to that timeline and then so forth and so on through all the other ones. That's called the mini worlds hypothesis. And this is, it sounds like science fiction, but this is one of the interpretations of this phenomenon because we don't really understand it, right? Now what's interesting here is you may be fooled or you may start to think, like I did when I first looked at this, what was, well, light is different. We say it's a particle, but how can it be a particle without mass? A photon does not have mass. Sure, it can act like a particle, but it's not really a particle, right? Here's the interesting thing. This right here is an interference pattern shown with a laser. So this is light. We know that light behaves in this way, that observation of it changes its nature. Hitachi actually did the experiment with an electron. And that's what this is. I should say with electrons, right? Let me take a step back here. You can actually do that experiment with one photon at a time, okay? And it will interfere with itself, right? It's not like water waves where you have the water particles interfering with other water particles. The very nature of that light will, if you do one photon at a time, of course, it'll just put one dot on the screen, but as you keep shooting one photon at a time out of there, you see that interference pattern appear, right? So there, it's not, Photons interfering with photons. It absolutely is. It's, a nat it's the nature of light. It is, a, it is a wave at that point. And in this case, it's not just light. It's also an electron. Um, by the way, the fact that the electron is in this uncertain state, it's called a state of superposition, when we're not exactly sure where it's going to be, that's another interpretation. They say it actually exists in all those positions at different probabilities. Um, that, that's what actually creates the stability of the atom. That, that's how it explains that the, that the atom is stable, um, which is another whole discussion. But, so Hitachi did this with atoms, and you're thinking, okay, well, atoms are fine, um, but they're also really small. They do have mass, right? So, so that's interesting. But they've also done this experiment with buckyballs, or Buckminster Fullerenes, as they're called, which is a carbon-60 atom arranged in a certain format. They've been able to get that these atoms um, and to shoot them through these walls in this, in this superposition state and to actually create an a, a, a interference pattern. So it appears like everything, as long as there is no observation on where you are and what your state is, everything could actually fit this, possibly even Schrodinger's cat, right? And that thought experiment that Schrodinger came up with he came up with this thought experiment that if you put a cat in a box and you put a random device in there that will kill the cat 50% of the time, are we saying that the cat is both, both alive and dead until we observe it? And the answer is, I don't know, right? In this case, if we can get that cat in a superposition state, everything about that cat in a superposition state and information about that cat doesn't leak to our classical known world as we experience it, it's very possible that could happen. So troubling philosophically. Schrodinger came up with this experiment to prove the inconsistencies of quantum mechanics, to prove that this is just absurd. Because guys, what we're saying is this could happen, but it's absurd, so this can't be reality. Turns out he was wrong. All right, so now let's talk about, um, let's talk about quantum computing. The truth is we don't know what exactly causes the collapse, right? We don't know how that actually fits into our world as, as we experience our world. It's this 
the subatomic world. Um, but that doesn't mean that we can't actually do something with it, right? Uh, what this is, so I need to talk about spin, right? These small particles have an intrinsic property called spin, okay? And what I mean by intrinsic property, you know, if you take a ball and you spin it and then push it in a direction, it'll have a tendency to veer towards the direction that it's, that it's spun. That's called angular momentum in physics, right? They have done these with small particles and recognize that there is some other effect there that looks like it is angular momentum. Because they can account for angular momentum, but this other part of angular momentum that they put inside this particle as they uh, mess with it, they realize, no, this is something else here. Uh, the, the actual motion and direction that's going cannot account for, um, for, for what we see in this experiment. So then they've come up with this intrinsic nature called spin. It's a really poor name because it makes you think that it's spinning in one direction, but that's only because it reminded them of what happens with angular momentum. In this case, it's, um, it's just a fundamental nature of the type of particle that it is, right? And what this experiment does is um, it shows you what the nature of the spin is. And, and there's something else that's important. When I say it's an intrinsic property, it is a quantum intrinsic property, which means things that have spin, which is all small particles, they are in a superposition of that spin. Just like they're in a superposition of location, they're in a superposition of the spin. You can break it down to just that. And when you send a particle through a field, through an electromagnetic field, it will veer up or it will veer down based on its spin. And this is what they talk about as um, the intrinsic spin. They say that it's either spin up or it's spin down, right? That's the intrinsic nature. And they can measure that. You can measure that, whether it's going to be spin up or spin down. Well, you can see now, and again, this is a quantum mechanic property. As it's traveling, before you measure it, and in this case, the measurement happens over here as soon as it hits the field. Whenever you measure it, before you measure it, it is in a superposition of both up and down until it's measured, and then now it's either up or down, right? Which sounds a lot like binary language, a one or a zero. This is the basis of a qubit, right? A quantum bit. In a normal classical bit, you have one or zero, that's it, okay? In a qubit, you have something like this because of its superposition. It is the way it's described in the mathematical understanding behind it, it is in a position of one and zero and in between all the time until you measure it, right? So, so that's, as it's traveling, until it's measured, it is in this, this position. And so what we have here, this is what's called a block sphere, and this is a representation of this qubit. I, didn't, I don't have graphics for this, um, but... What's important to note is you can measure the spin of one of these particles or measure a spin of a qubit in three different directions. And it will have different, um, it will have a, it will have, it, it, it's a different spin on different locations. So if you actually measure the spin in the z direction, then it's going to be one or a zero. But then you can also measure it in the y direction and it will be a one or a zero. And you can measure it in the z direction or the x direction, and it will also be a one or a zero, okay? Um, and this is just a mathematical representation of where that particle would be and how it is represented with the, with the information between the spins. What's also very important to note here is when you measure the particle in the z direction, you measure the qubit in the z direction, you cannot know what it is in the y direction, okay? That's, that, it, that comes down to the, um, while it travels, it's a wave. And then once you observe it, it collapses to that point. But at that point, because we don't know exactly where the direction is for the, or, or where the momentum is for those other points, it goes back into a state of superposition for those, for those different points. And that becomes very important later when we talk about how we get this, or how we use this, this kind of qubit. When you observe it, it goes to a one or a zero. 
A single qubit is no different than a classical qubit. It, uh, because once you observe it, it's a one or a zero, it doesn't really matter that it's in this state in between, right? Um, so, yeah, so a single qubit is that way. So we need to actually have an interaction with other qubits. And this is where we're getting to the spooky part, at least what Einstein called spooky. There's a way for you to take a particle, a particle in a state of superposition, and have it interact with another particle that's in a state of superposition, okay? And then they become what's called entangled. And this right here is an experiment showing um, the splitting of a photon. A photon has its momentum, and then when it splits into two different, its frequencies are halved. And when those frequencies are halved, if the spin, the spin needs to be preserved, okay? Because of, it, it actually is related to conservation of, of uh, momentum, which is related to conservation of energy, which is related to conservation of matter. That you cannot have that photon split into, and to create two different frequencies of energy that, that, that is more or less than the energy that was first put in. And so when you entangle these two photons, there's a way to entangle them so that you can show the spin in one direction. And once you observe one for the spin in one direction, you automatically know what the spin is on the other one. Even though they are in a superposition state at this point, once one gets defined, in order to conserve that momentum, the other one also has to be defined, okay? It's a very strange concept. And what you can do with that, though, is once you have them entangled, and you know that if I observe this one, that will change its nature from wave to particle, or from, yeah, from wave to, from the, from the superposition of spin, to a one or a zero, and once I do that, then the other one has to be changed as well, okay? What's interesting about this, and this is a spooky action at a distance, when you have that entanglement, it doesn't matter how far apart you are. This right here is the distance of the known universe, right? At least by one, by one place I found. And, um, and what, you're, what they're saying is, and this is one of the things that Einstein had a really big problem with, because Einstein is well known for proving, beyond shadow of a doubt, that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, right? Everybody knows that, that's just common knowledge nowadays. The problem with this is, if we take these two entangled qubits, and we put one on the other side of the universe, and then we observe that one over here, right, once we observe it, how does this one know that it needs to be zero? Right? It changes as far as we know instantaneously. Right? And when I say as far as we know, I mean clearly we haven't sent another particle to the other side of the universe to do this test. Right? What we have done is we've sent entangled particles across the world. And um, you, you'll see some headlines, some news stories about them measuring the speed of this interaction at being 10,000 times the speed of light. They've actually done this. Right? So that raises some big questions, right? Now, the question is, can we actually have communication faster than the speed of light, right? Which is, uh, uh, it, you actually can't, and I'll explain why, but that would be really cool if we could, right? All right, so let's say we have this entangled um, pair of qubits. Um, yeah. So, so with the entangled pair of qubits, the reason that you can't actually get information faster than the speed of light is because if we did this, if we had one qubit here and another qubit there, now clearly there is something on a quantum level that is being transferred across there. Um, Einstein, what his, his impression was in his paper to show that there's something incomplete in quantum mechanics, he said that what is happening is all the information that you need to know what state that particle is going to be in when you observe it is following that particle. It really has nothing to do with this other particle over here. And he called it a hidden variable. We don't know what they are, but there's gotta be some hidden variables in there because we can't transfer that information faster than the speed of light. Um, it turns out um, there is an experiment called um, Bell's theorem. Uh, Albert, or I should say um, John Bell, uh, was a scientist in the 70s who came up with a thought experiment that was then tested in the 80s that it's very complex, well, it's mathematical, so it's fairly complex, 
Um, I'll put a link in the notes that you can go to and read. It's actually pretty fascinating. It's very clever. But he showed, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that there is no hidden variable. That instead, when you actually change the nature of a particle here, you absolutely change the nature of its entangled pair over here. Okay? And again, you do it instantaneously, as far as we know. So then what can we do with that? The three things that we're dealing with here is these qubits are in a superposition state. They're like, the one way to describe it is it's in, it's in all states of zero and one and in between. Um, they're also entangled. And when you measure one on the z-axis, then that tells you what the other on the z-axis is going to be, which implies that you should be able to measure one on the y-axis and then be able to know both of those over here. Um, you absolutely can't because it changes its nature, but it, changes, it actually changes the nature of both of them, all right, as you're doing that measurement, which means there's this strange interactivity that happens between them that is very mathematical and allows us to put information in those interactions and allows us to do some calculations with them, right, if you had a quantum computer. Um, what we have here, if I asked you all to do this calculation right here, um, y'all would be able to do that pretty easily, right? You get it done, you know exactly how to do that. It's this big number times that big number, and you would uh, do your long multiplication and then add them up together, or you pull out your calculator or whatever. When you do that, you come up with the answer. Now I'm going to ask you to do something different, a thought experiment. Instead, I'm giving you that number right there, and I'm going to ask you to come up with what are the factors that created that number. What are the two things that actually created this number that are multiplied together. Not only that, I'm going to ask you to come up with all of them. All right? If I asked you to do that, that would be a lot harder, wouldn't it? It would take you a lot more time. Okay? This is called, this is integer factorization. This is known to be a difficult problem in computer science. Right? You can't, when you have a large enough number over here, it is possible to have a big enough number over there that all the computing power in the world will never be able to come up with the solution. And I say never, literally, longer than the universe has been around. All right? Why is that important? Because this is a chart of public key cryptography. The security of public key cryptography is relying on the fact that that problem is hard and computers can't solve it. To be able to take a large number and to pull out its prime factors is a very difficult problem that computers can't solve, right? So let's say we had a 500-bit key. It would take this long for classical computers to, to be able to find those prime factors, okay? If we had a quantum computer, there is an algorithm called Shor's algorithm that is waiting for the quantum computer to be run, but it looks solid, it looks... It looks um, um, it looks like it, it actually would work. And it uses, it uses these strange co connections between these qubits to, I'm sure I'm going to say this right. You'll hear in the popular press a lot of times, people will say a quantum computer will be able to calculate all the possible answers, and then it'll pull out the right answer. Right? That's not accurate. That's not how it works. But with Shor's algorithm, you can actually come up with this in less than two seconds. Right? That makes, RSA in, that makes RSA obsolete. What is happening there in Shor's algorithm, it doesn't look at all, it doesn't calculate all possible answers and then pulls out the right one because all these qubits that are required for this, once you observe one of them, all the other ones collapse, right? They are no longer in that state that has that information that is related to their, in their relationships. They collapse, they actually call it decoherence. That once you actually have, once you pick one, so let's say you did all the calculations and you say, well, I think this is probably the right one. You reached in and grabbed it. Everything else would decohere. Everything else would erase. And it's just a random selection as to whether or not you picked the right answer. Right? It does go through and calculate all possible results. But what it does instead, using that strange interaction of the X, Y, and Z um, uh, uh, vectors, using that strange interaction, it is able to uh, go in and have those interactions between those bits cancel out the wrong answers, okay? So then the only thing that's left are things that have a high degree of probability. 
And it's not, it's not an absolute answer. It's just a high degree of probability. But in this particular problem, all we have to do is say we have these two prime factors. Uh, we think these are prime factors. Let's just first test primality on both of them, which is the easy thing to do. And then let's multiply them together and see if we have the original number. So you can have a list of high probability things. And, um, and that's why you're able to actually break this down in two seconds. Um, but again, we are waiting for a computer to do this. Now, you guys have probably heard that there is a quantum computer on the market today. Um, and I will, actually, before I do that, oh, my animated GIF's not working. Oh, well. If you saw this, um, this is another feature that I want to talk about called uh, a quantum tunneling, and this is important for another algorithm. What happens with quantum tunneling? Because as the particle is traveling, it is in this superposition state that we don't know exactly where it is. It just has a probability of being in these different locations. And if you saw this, when it hits the wall, this is a barrier, a classic barrier that says we cannot go beyond this, right? When it hits this wall in this superposition state, there is a small chance that it can actually tunnel right through that wall if it's small enough. And um, that comes out from the math, and then we found out that that's actually real. Um, our transistors nowadays are getting so small that the electrons in the transistors have to deal with this problem, that the electrons can actually tunnel through a normal barrier that we would normally say that, that a physical object could not get through. There's a probability that it'll just jump to the other side. And that's, that's a reality. We, we're dealing with that now. What's great about that is, let's say... This um, is called uh, quantum annealing. Let's say we had a function that produced this line, and we wanted to know what the, what the global minimum of this is, right? If we wanted to know what a local minimum is, all we'd do is just pick a random, random spot on the, on the x-axis, and we would say, okay, this random spot here, well, let's just look uh, one up. It's, it's going up, one down, it's going down. So let's just follow that down until we get down to here, and we know that that's just the that's just a local minimum and we're fine and we get that very quickly. But if we actually wanted to know what the global minimum was right there, what would we have to do? We'd have to look at every single spot on this graph, right, and compare it to what we've already known as the minimum, right? And now imagine that in a 3D plane. That gets to be very, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it takes a lot of calculation to be able to do that. But with that concept of quantum tunneling, where we can actually tunnel through barriers, there's an algorithm out there that, that called quantum annealing that allows them, you can find a minimum, a local minimum, and then tunnel through without having to go to all these other spots over here. You can, you, the, the, uh, the math allows you to tunnel through the other side, find another local min minimum, get down to the bottom of that, and then from there you can look in all directions and see that you're at the bottom. It becomes much, much, much faster. Now, this is not as interesting as the RSA or public key cryptography problem because that one, you know, that's going to throw, throw us into chaos, right? Um, well, we'll just, we'll just stop doing stuff online. I guess that is kind of chaos, <laughs> at least for us, right? So um, the reason I wanted to bring this problem up, though, is because there's a computer that is on the market today. You can buy a quantum computer. It's only $15 million, right? A company out of Canada called D-Wave. They are um, producing these and selling them. Google has one. Um, one of the defense contractors, I forget which one, they have one as well. Google bought one for artificial intelligence research. I'll talk about that in a minute. But this computer is specialized. This quantum computer is specialized to deal with the, with the uh, quantum uh, uh, annealer problem. Right? It can actually find the global minimum of a function. And you can imagine that can be useful for all sorts of things because we're talking about, you know, what's the lowest risk on your portfolio? That's one of the things that you want to find for global minimum, uh, even topological, all these different problems that, I mean, it's a really useful thing that you can do. But what it can't do is it can't actually run Shor's algorithm. You can't factor primes in polynomial time, okay? So, um, So yeah, and this is called the D-Wave. The problem is they have shown several different experiments out of this. None of them have really been verified to have quantum effects, 
right? It's a proprietary system. It's closed boxed in that, in that respect to some, ex to some extent. And so they've been able to do some calculations, but none of them have been able to show either an entangled state or, or anything better than what a classical computer do for, the, for these problems, for the, um, for the uh, annealer problem. But they're still working on it, and it's still going to be cool. Although this design will never be able to solve Shor's algorithm. There are other research teams, some out of Australia. They're probably the leaders on the, on the, in this front right now to do a, a um, general quantum computer. And Google, even though they bought a D-Wave and still have a uh, relationship with D-Wave, um, they are actually starting a, their own different arm in order to build a general quantum computer because D-Wave is not going to get there. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, do we know differentiators between the quantum computer and the classic computer, right? So one of the biggest ones, I mean, first of all, that's a really good question, and that was a slide I meant to put in here, but I didn't. Um, th one of the biggest problems that we have with quantum computers is um, the, the, the decoherence problem, right? You cannot have any information that is inside the, the quantum computer, in the processor where these things are in that state, none of the information about that can leak out into the system around you while it's doing its calculations. Because if it does, then it will decohere, which will collapse all the other um, qubits as well. Right? And that's a really big, difficult problem that they have. How do you create this, these, these, um, these entangled states of all these different qubits, but then not observe them? Right? And you have to then put the algorithm through there, and then at the, at the end, it spits out some sort of answer for it. And that, when I say that becomes a big problem, it's not only a big problem in the sense that it's difficult to shield something like that from the environment. That's the physical problem. But I imagine as, you know, we as software engineers, imagine, I mean, it literally is a black box, right? You cannot see what's happening inside that system without destroying um, your, your calculation mechanism. And that's, I don't know, that's going to be frustrating as all get out, right? Because we'll be like, I don't know why it's doing that. Well, can't you dig into it? Nope. <laughs> I can't do that, at least not at this level, no. And so does that answer your question? Is that one of the things? Yeah. Right, so the other thing about that as well is there is a whole branch now of quantum computing that deals with error correction that there are ways to entangle bits to make it so that if one of the bits is observed, the other ones aren't necessarily, um, aren't necessarily useless for the solution. And it's like a whole branch of, of many people who are working on that problem. These guys, um, um, these guys don't really care so much about error correction for, with what they're doing, right? Whereas a general quantum computer needs to deal with that error correction. Right? Yep. Yeah, I will get to that uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence. The question was, um, you know, compared to traditional, how many, uh, how many different transistors do you have on an existing computer, whereas with a quantum computer, how, how much do you need? Uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, I'll talk about that. So you, you need a lot fewer qubits than, than you do uh, on a classical computer. And now we're talking about artificial intelligence. Next slide. Great question. All right, so... Um, this is really interesting to me, and, and I don't know exactly what Google is doing here when they're actually purchasing this, but there are researchers out, because I haven't been able to, I mean, I follow them a little bit, but I know IBM is specifically doing this and uh, other researchers. There is a whole branch of artificial intelligence where they are trying to create a brain. And when I say create a brain, I'm not saying an electronic brain that we talk about as a computer. I mean, they literally want to take what matters about our brain at a neuron level and replicate that in hardware. Because the idea there is once you do that, once you're able, because their view is our brain is just nothing but a really complex computer, right, that can, that can actually do things very fast and can, transfer and can actually deal with a lot of information, right? Once you do that, once you transfer that over and you create a hardware system that has enough transistors in there to match the neurons that we have in our brain, which is about 100 billion neurons, um, IBM has actually put 
one using classical computers has put one together that deals with 10 billion neurons. So order of magnitude off. We'll get there eventually. But the idea is once you do that, then you will have created basically a person, a, a real artificial intelligence. You're creating a human-like brain that has the capabilities of everything that our brain does. Right? And then there are people who talk about this, when you talk about the, uh, creating this brain, who want to then be able to scan the neurons in the state that our neurons in, are in our brain and make a copy of that over to one of these computers. Right? Um, you, that's the transhumanist movement. All right? And they literally, when you do that, imagine being able to take what makes you you, which is mainly your brain. You know, some of us may be proud about our hair or something, right? I'm clearly not, but... Uh, <laughs> But, you know, what makes you you, if you could actually transfer that brain over to this computer over here, then you are now, I mean, you don't have to sleep, right? You don't have to, you don't get tired. Maybe you get cranky. <laughs> but you don't get cranky because you're tired, right? I mean, I don't know. That's the question. And then it actually raises these other big questions about, about what is a consciousness, right? Are we talking about really transferring our consciousness over there and creating consciousness? And there's a, there's a big debate about that going on. When we talk about, to get to Bill's question about how much data you can do with a quantum computer, because of the strangeness of these qubits and the way that they interact with each other and the information that you can put in those relationships, because of that, you only need 300 qubits to be able to represent every single atom in the known universe. Right? That's a very small amount. Imagine having a computer that only has 300 transistors in it which is not an exact map, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. So that's one of the reasons, I'm sure, that's one of the reasons why these, uh, and I suspect this, I don't know this for sure, for sure, but I suspect that's one of the reasons why there's so much artificial intelligence research that is interested in quantum computers, because the information process and the information ability that, that you will have in a quantum computer is so much greater than what you can do in a classical computer. When I say IBM did it with uh, 10 billion transistors, um, or, or, or to say represented 10 billion neurons, that was a massive, massive um, classical computer that they had to run. Chris? Do you know uh, how many qubits does the current largest? Um, I don't, the only ones I know are the published, the published ones. So D-Wave has one that goes up to 512 qubits. But again, the big problem there is it's not a general purpose quantum computer. Right, so they can't do things like Shor's algorithm or a lot of these other things. They're very specific to that quantum annealing problem. That's the only thing they can solve, which they actually probably don't need that many qubits, but you know, they're a public company and they have to be able to make announcements. So they'll keep putting more qubits on there and say, hey, we now got up to 800 qubits, you know, although it's not that useful for them. Or maybe it is. I don't know. There may be some other algorithms in there that I don't know about as well. But um, yeah, so 512, that's the one that Google bought. It's called a D-Wave 2. And uh, they're actually using, again, it's artificial intelligence. That's what they bought it for. Uh, I suspect that this is why. There may be some other reasons. I know they're talking about um, doing um, some artificially intelligent machine learning with, um, with those. Uh, I don't know the algorithms there. And, you know, that, that stuff hasn't been published yet. So. Or at least not to where I've seen it. It may be out there. I just don't know where to look. But the idea here is if we can actually do that transfer, so let's talk about consciousness. And this is where it gets to be very interesting to me, at least. Because if we do that transfer, let's say we are able to transfer our knowledge, the transhumanists, uh, the vast majority of AI researchers in this field will say that consciousness is an emergent property. That once you get a complex enough computer, then consciousness will just come out. Don't know exactly where it is, it just, it just shows up there, right? Um, and so, which is interesting to think about. So they think that once you have this computer that's very complex enough, then the consciousness is gonna emerge from that and and we're going to be able to trans, you know, to, to, to leave our human bodies behind and have this singularity where we're actually doing amazing things and have become something, we have evolved something different than what we are. Um, then there's another group of researchers, right, who say, no, we don't believe that that's what's happening. In fact, it looks like that what might be their downfall is quantum. They're using quantum computers to try to simulate all of these different neurons that are in the brain. But here's the question that I had, and I, I, didn't, I hadn't actually read these guys yet before I came up with this question, and I realized if we are doing something in our brain that is quantum level, 
How do we replicate that? We don't even know what causes that collapse exactly. We don't know deterministically where those photons are going to be. How do you program for that? Has anybody here been given a spec that says, you know, do something, and yet I'm not going to tell you how to do it or what, or, or there's just no direct way on how to do that. They just say, you know, solve the energy problem of the world, right? <laughs> right? We've all had that experience, and that's kind of what this problem is. And so the people who are, um, the people who are dealing with, um, people who are dealing with the quantum mechanics um, are, are with the artificial intelligence part of this, the transhumanists, um, they just, you know, they just need it to be an emergent property because they don't want there to be a quantum effect there because if there is, it kind of throws their plans into a loop. Um, there is a researcher, though, um, uh, Roger Penrose, he's a physicist. He wrote a book in the 90s called um, The Emperor's New Brain, and he posited, based on a thought experiment, that there had to be quantum effects happening inside our brain somewhere. Right? It's a very interesting thought experiment, great book. Um, and then when he posited that and put his book out there, there was an anesthesiologist named Stuart Hameroff who came out and said, I think I know where those quantum effects are. And he came up with this concept of the quantum effects happening in the microtubules in the brain. Uh, January of this year, there was, and the reason I have a leaf here, it's not very clear, um, one of the first explanations as to why we don't need quantum effects in our brain as they say, we can't replicate quantum effects unless it's a very cold and dry environment, right? Which doesn't make sense because the light, I don't know, they, 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 that's what their reason was. And they say, well, sure, it's not in our brain because cold and dry, our brain is not. But we've actually found quantum mechanical effects happening in photosynthesis in plants. Very clear, it's there. It's not dry, right? It's not cold. And yet it's happening there. And so they got past that. January of this year, there was some research done where they found in the photosynthesis where those quantum mechanical effects are happening, there's a spike in a specific frequency of energy that happens uh, in that quantum mechanical effect. They found that exact same spike happening in the microtubules in the brain, some independent research from, from Hameroff. So they, they've claimed victory. They said, oh, yeah, we found it. But then the transhumanists were like, no, you haven't. We're, keep looking. Right? And that's one of the big, and I actually think that the, um, I think that, that Penrose probably has it right myself because I like the fact that his theory is falsifiable whereas the emergent property theory is not falsifiable, right? Because all you have to say is, we don't have a complex enough computer, that's why consciousness hasn't emerged yet. So just keep building more and more complex computers, and you can never falsify that because you'll continue to keep building complex computers and say, well, just need to get more and more complex. It doesn't matter what I think, I'm just a lay person, so. I also have to, you know, I do think that we are different, which is a confirmation bias. All right, so that's um, that's all I have. Do we have any questions? You yeah. Again? What's that? Can you tell it again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, in fact, I prepared a slide for that. <laughs> all right. So he asked. The question was, can I elaborate on the retro causality experiment? This happened in 1999. Um, I think the lead researcher for that was out of uh, Texas A&M. This is, uh, this, this, it, it blows my mind, right? All right, so this is a double slit experiment. And I'm sorry, I mean, it was a hastily prepared slide because I kind of anticipated this question. Um, so double slit experiment, you have these uh, light waves going through. They go through here. And in both of these locations, what we have is a photon splitter. So it actually splits the photon and creates an entangled pair at both places, right? One of those entangled pair goes to the detector at D1. Right? The other photon pair comes to this mirror. It's a half mirror, so half of them will come to D3. The other half will go to D2. And this is a very simplification of the actual experiment. It's actually a lot more complex than this, but this is the functional outcome of that. And in this one, we do the same thing. We split one, send it to D1. The other one, we hit the half mirror, and it either goes to D4 half the time or D2 half the time. Now, what's interesting about this, if you look at all these detectors, there's only two of them that you know which slit it went through, right? At D3, you know it went through that slit. At D4, you know it went through that slit. At D2, we've erased that information. We don't have that information as to which slit it went through anymore. And over at D1, it never had that information. Right? Sorry about that. And so 
What's interesting here is you can do this. If um, you look at the pattern here at D3, because you know what slit it went through, that pattern is a particle pattern. It's not a wave pattern. If you look at the patterns here at D2, it's a wave pattern because you don't know what slit it went through, right? This detection here happens nine nanoseconds after, or maybe it's four nanoseconds. What does it matter, right? <laughs> time is time, right? Maybe Einstein would argue. But anyway, um, the point is, uh, this happened X nanoseconds beyond, after this, the particles hit this right here, right? The point is, since you know that these particles are entangled, and you can actually look at the time that it hits here, one of those particles hit there, then you would know the time that it hits over here, nine nanoseconds before, right? And if you could isolate those ones over here, if you can isolate them so that all you would show is the ones that are related to this, then you would know which one of those went through that slit, right? You actually have that information about which slit it went through. But when you do that, when you isolate those particles that are entangled with this and only look at those, a particle pattern emerges. And yet, it hits this wall before we actually detect which of the slits it goes through. Before we know which of the slits it goes through, before the detector happens, it hits that wall nine nanoseconds before. And there's two explanations that I know of, right? One is retrocausality, which creates all sorts of phys uh, philosophical problems. Why? We live our life in such a way where we have cause and effect, right? Cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect. This is where we have effect and cause, which is really troubling to us, and it should be troubling to us, right? Um, I've heard people even say that this assumes, or this uh, supposes, if it is true retrocausality, it supposes that we could observe something today that changed something that happened two billion years ago, right? That, that's just troubling, right? It's troubling to me, at least. Now, I say, the reason I say that that's not the only explanation, there is another interpretation of that, of what's happening there. That interpretation, and this actually has other philosophical problems, right? But that interpretation is, since we can't know which of the ones hit there until we look at it here, it is possible that when we observe those here, that our view of reality is changing, right? That our understanding of what happened nine nanoseconds before is just completely changed in, in, our, in our brain, right? That has other philosophical problems, right? I mean, neither one of them are ideal, right? They're both, I think retrocausality has the best explanation, probably, but I really don't know. John, did I answer your question? Okay, John? If you made a copy of yourself with all your information, now, uh, it, you know if you did a yeah. So, so they could ask, they could ask your clone to see if, yeah, uh, that I don't know. Honestly, I, I think the, the transhumanists that I've read, what they're talking about is uh, replacing the brain piece by piece because they don't like this idea of creating a separate you because it's not really you that is going to live forever, right? It's just going to be a copy of you and you may actually be ticked off at him because he's living forever and you're going to die, right? If you're afraid of death. You're copying it, yeah. yeah. Pablo? Yeah, I don't have a slide for that. So the question was, can I go back and explain how a single photon can interfere with itself? Yeah, so how that's measured, um, I, I guess I do have a slide that will kind of represent that. Yeah, so this right here. So what they do here, and I, there is a video that you can see of the electron happening in this way, but imagine being able to do this. This is a photon emitter, and it will emit one photon at a time, right? And so you shoot the photon out, and as you shoot the photon out, you wait to see where it hits on the wall here before you shoot another photon out. And that means that that photon, if it's just one photon, and uh, it's traveling in a wave pattern, if we were actually interfering with other photons, then you would need another photon out there to create that wave pattern on the back.
But what happens here, as soon as you shoot the one photon out, it will travel as a wave through both of those holes, and it will appear in one of these lines right here. Now, when you first see it, it does just look like another photon on the screen in a random spot, right? But then when you shoot another one out, it puts a dot there, and another one out, it puts a dot there, and another one out, and as you keep doing that over and over again, this pattern emerges, which shows you that we, it is that interference pattern, but since it's one photon at a time, it is that photon interfering with itself in its waveform. Does that answer your question? Is it, is it troubling? Yeah. yeah, it's pretty troubling. Over here, I don't remember your name. Uh, Raphael. Raphael, yeah, what do you mean? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I, I do know that one of the big problems with the D-Wave, the question was, the D-Wave computer, how much uh, electrical power does it consume? It's quite a bit because uh, one of the things they have to do in order to get those, um, to, to get those states to cohere is they, and to not decohere is it needs to be very, 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 very cold. And some of the times you will see, when I say very, 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 very cold, their claim is it's the coldest spot in the universe. It is below absolute zero, which I didn't know was even possible before I started reading this, right? So, um, so that's one of the problems they have. The machine itself, I mean, I didn't show you a full size of it, but it, is, it has this aluminum shielding. It has this laser that shoots down to make it cold, which, yes, lasers can make things cold. You have to look that up. But <laughs> they don't just make things hot. But a laser that shoots down on the, on the die, on, on the chip, and it has this, it's, it's very futuristic, but they have enough space in there for people, for the scientists to walk around it. Um, so there's, it's, it's at early stages. It's not efficient at all in, in that respect. It may be someday, though. Who knows? Right. Chris? Right. So the question was, um, is the reason that the machines that are being built are, um, are just a um, reason that they're specialized machines to solve specific problems rather than general problems? Is that because of the function, is that the nature of the machine, or is that just because of the early stages? And the answer is kind of both, actually. Uh, in one case, it is the nature of the problem in that there are only certain kinds of problems that we know about. That get, a, that get a dramatic speed up with, with quantum computing. There are, the vast majority of computing, like when you sit down to play your video game, it's not gonna go that much faster on a quantum computer, right? So there are certain problems, but this particular problem, like the ones that's being built by D-Wave, they chose this particular annealing problem to solve because they knew that was the easier way to get to market and to, and to actually um, have their investors be happy, right? Because the other problem, the, the one, the general quantum computing problem that will actually, um, so our, our solution that will actually solve Shor's algorithm, that one's much more complex to deal with. And so they went with the easy quantum computer problem, which, I mean, easy I don't, is relative, I suppose. But, um, but yeah, that's, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, the point there was there's probably a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, you know, pressure in industry in order to stop Shor's algorithm from happening. Um, there might be, but it, they're not going to be able to, right? I mean, <laughs> well, that, that's actually legit. I'm sure that's why the Defense Department has one, right? Has one of these computers, even though this is not one that will solve Shor's algorithm. They want that expertise. Well, I'll say this, imagine this. Um, so you're right that it, when I say that, that cracking, using Shor's algorithm to crack public key encryption, that is uh, going to be a problem. Um, but if we actually have a quantum computer that can do that, we can come up with quantum algorithms that will make this much, much dealer. And, and so, so let me give you an example. Right now when we talk about RSA, the public private key encryption, we actually use the public private key in our HTTPS communication to send a separate key across, right? That separate key that gets across, we, we're sending that uh, securely through public-private key because we wanna make sure that nobody has it. And then we use that shared key on both sides. Well, with a quantum channel, if you had a quantum channel, I can just send you a key and you will know whether or not somebody looked at it. That's even more secure than what we have today, right? But that, that, that is, it's crazy. 
Uh, but here's the other problem. I'm talking about being able to denial of service, right? All you have to do is observe it, and yeah, you're never going to get a message across, right? Yeah. But, but, that, but that's actually even more secure than what we have today because you don't really know for sure, at least on a fundamental physics level, whether or not somebody has access to your shared key. In this case, you will know that. At least, at least you'll know it did not get observed uh, across the channel. So there's a lot of, I mean, by the time we get that, I'm sure that's going to be fleshed out. I imagine we'll be fine. It probably won't be that much chaos as, as it appears like it will. I don't know. I haven't heard. The question was if I've known that SETI does that. You know what? I forgot to do one thing, and I want to show you all this. This goes back to the um, artificial intelligence discussion. In artificial intelligence, the question is, um, is, are there quantum effects in the brain that we need, or are there not, right? And I also, I also went on the side to say that I think there are, right, myself. I, I think that those guys, the Penrose and Hameroff, probably have it right. Um, but again, who am I? But the point is, there's quantum effects happening around us all the time that we don't even realize, right? And I'm going to show you an example of that. I've been using this laser pen the whole time. And you have no idea that this is actually a quantum device, right? And I'm going to show you an example of that. Hey, Matt, can you ch change that? Do you see the interference pattern? See the slits? I modified this. I put a, a, a wire in the middle and then covered up and created two slits. This is a little mini double slit experiment right there. Right? And this shows you that light is absolutely a wave as it travels. Oh. Thanks, guys. Pablo, do you have another question? Yeah. <laughs> it's not that it's not a concern. Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, when you uh, talk to, you'd have to actually go read up on D-Wave. I, I I'm not really sure. The question was, why is error correction uh, not a concern with the D-Wave or the annealing problem? And uh, honestly, I don't know why they're not that concerned with it. I'm sure it's just the very nature of the problem itself that they don't have to worry about the decoherence um, in, in, in those cases, right? Or maybe if they do, they, there's no other way to solve it except for it not, except for it not to have any kind of error correction. Honestly, I, I really don't know. I'd have to look that up. Bob? So people who are, who are creating a big enough complex network hoping consciousness will arrive, how well they know it's about? The question was... <laughs> 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 That's a really good point. So the question was, if people are building, uh, trying to build a brain with a complex and complex enough computer, then how do you know that it actually has reached consciousness? And, uh, and then Pablo said that it'll tell you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Update Badger shows up. Your computer has now reached consciousness. <laughs> Go home. <laughs> yeah. All right, any other questions? Cool. Thanks, guys.